Uh, I think we just give the floor straight away to Professor Francesco Schur, who needs no further introduction. You know him already. Thank you, Francesco. Thank you. So, where are you? Thank you very much again for inviting me uh, to this exciting conference uh, and uh, you know there have been so many uh, interesting uh, presentations so far um, and uh, I hope that I can give a little contribution uh, to the conference by talking about um, the topic uh, Petra and I have agreed on um, when you were so kind to invite me so the influence of big states um, on uh, small states. Um, the the issue uh, the issues uh, that I'm going to to cover uh, you know are uh, within this list of questions. So first of all, I would like to talk uh, <clears throat> about whether there is a viable uh, definitions of small states and big states. We have uh, briefly talked about that <clears throat> at the beginning, but uh, you know now I would like to uh, focus on uh, financial uh, centers. Then. Uh, the question how this influence can take place, so which forms of influence actually uh, exist. And uh, here I would like to make a difference between direct and indirect uh, uh, influence, uh, since uh, uh, from my point of view there is uh, uh, actually various categories. I want to make a distinction between the chosen influence and uh, the forced uh, uh, influence. And of course, uh, we need to raise the question whether at some stage uh, the influence can be so strong uh, uh, as to uh, uh, raise some doubts whether uh, we are still talking about actually a sovereign state or whether uh, the sovereignty is kind of undermined by this pressure. Um, and, uh, you know, after that, I would like to, to broaden a bit the horizon uh, to talk also about uh, international and supranational organizations that often are used, or I would even say abused, by large states, big states, to put uh, small states under uh, pressure. Uh, the last topic, and that's basically beyond the topic that we have agreed on, but still I would briefly like to focus on that as well, uh, to give you some uh, examples uh, for scenarios where actually the small states have influenced uh, the, the, the big ones. So, uh, you know, these are uh, the questions. Now, big states, uh, what are uh, big states? What are small states? What are uh, uh, big uh, financial centers? What are small uh, financial centers? We've discussed in the keynote panel today uh, that, um, you know, we might draw the line at, I guess, 1.5 million. That's what, you know, uh, has been suggested in the conference uh, program. Um, but, you know, I guess we have uh, agreed on the fact uh, that, you know, there might be different uh, uh, methods of distinguishing the large, uh, the big uh, jurisdictions, the big states from the uh, small uh, ones. Uh, when we talk about... Um, um, uh, financial centers, uh, you know, we could think about uh, is a financial center, so a jurisdiction that offers uh, financial services uh, as one of the major fields of the economy, uh, uh, you know, at a certain stage, like are there certain uh, uh, assets under management uh, from uh, other uh, from people, not resident people, uh, so does this qualify a jurisdiction to be uh, considered to be a large, a big financial uh, uh, center? Uh, but I would uh, probably prefer uh, the uh, 
uh, distinction, uh, especially from a legal point of view in, in all sorts of uh, law that involve uh, the financial uh, center, um, according uh, to the influence. So whether there is an incoming influence, of course, you know, we know we are all subject to a lot of influences from uh, supranational, international bodies, but we might also consider is there an influence from this uh, presumably small jurisdiction uh, going out uh, to the rest of the uh, world. So um, now I would like to make a difference, a distinction between direct and indirect uh, uh, influence. Direct influence uh, would mean that a small state directly replicates the law of another uh, state uh, and so that there is no intermediate body in between organizing the adoption of uh, specific legal uh, principles. Um, on the other hand, the indirect influence takes place through, uh, often takes place through international or supranational uh, um, uh, bodies on specific uh, legal uh, issues. Um, as you have, no, I'm not a tax lawyer, so I'm not going to talk about tax law today. I'm a, you know, company law, uh, private law, trust law person. Um, anyway, <clears throat> we know, and this is what I'm going to tell you now, is, uh, especially uh, regards to the next slide, uh, we all know that when it comes to tax law, uh, there has been a huge pressure by big states on small states, because big states always think that they are losing uh, uh, tax uh, money, tax uh, income, uh, by people structuring their private wealth or companies structuring their wealth through small uh, jurisdictions. And uh, since the, you know, the tax law uh, part is, will be missing today, uh, I'm really curious because I'm sure in the audience there will be uh, some tax law, uh, you know, experts, whether uh, you will be so kind to give some input on that. Anyway, um, if we look at the types of influence, so deliberate influence or imposed influence, uh, the deliberate influence means that within the decision making on a political level, uh, there is a choice, yes, we want to, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, we want to accept uh, some suggestion by a big state as far as our uh, legislation is uh, concerned. And for instance, when we talk about the different field of uh, law where a lot of so-called offshore financial centers have specialized, so the field of uh, so-called asset protection, or we also call it wealth preservation, uh, well, uh, in, in, in these fields, uh, of course, there is also some pressure. There is jurisdictions um, of, you know, like rather big uh, states uh, that uh, <clears throat> put small uh, uh, jurisdictions, small states under pressure by saying uh, enable enforcement of foreign judgments, for instance. Uh, within the European uh, states, uh, this could mean uh, <clears throat> please ratify the Lugano Convention and make, you know, judgments enforceable. And there are states that are of the opinion, no, we don't. We don't want to have foreign <coughs> judgments enforceable. So this is just a, an, an example uh, that I could give you uh, for, uh, you know, influence that can be in a kind of a zone, uh, an area in between uh, uh, deliberate and imposed influence. Now, for my paper, uh, I've chosen some jurisdictions uh, because I think, you know, if you want to explain something, you have to make a choice. So obviously I've chosen Liechtenstein because, as you know, I'm based uh, in Liechtenstein. So in Liechtenstein, it's quite an interesting mixed uh, jurisdiction. Then uh, Jersey, Guernsey, I've, uh, uh, you know, chosen them, even though I'm aware of the fact that uh, Jersey and Guernsey are not states uh, under all definitions, but still there are jurisdictions uh, with a different uh, uh, law as compared to the United Kingdom, and then San Marino in Italy. So, you know, I've chosen these for my, uh, so uh, here is the population more or less, and you see the influence in Liechtenstein, Austria, Switzerland, Germany, the influence uh, on Jersey, Guernsey, obviously is the United Kingdom, 
and on San Marino, uh, the influence obviously is Italy. So we have three language groups, the German speaking, the English speaking, and the Italian speaking language groups within uh, <clears throat> Europe. Now, um, the, the direct influence, uh, so we, which are the ways how this uh, direct influence uh, actually happens? Um, due to my, you know, experience, it happens through common history, proximity, meaning geographically and culturally, the common language, and last but not least, the judiciary. So uh, uh, let me uh, give you um, basically a bit of a flavor of what uh, you know I, I'm, I'm talking about. When we talk about uh, common history, uh, in the case of Liechtenstein, <coughs> Liechtenstein gained full sovereignty in 1806, uh, <coughs> but then uh, you know when the Austrian-Hungarian Empire collapsed, so the uh, the Austrian civil code is still in force, the one that entered in force uh, um, in 18. Uh, uh, 11, 1812, but on the other hand, uh, since 90, the 1920s, Liechtenstein has adopted most, uh, a large part of Swiss law, so it's a mixed jurisdiction, uh, and uh, obviously, for obvious reasons, uh, the, the common history uh, has uh, uh, led to the result that there is a huge influence of Austrian law as well as uh, Swiss law. So, for instance, for property law, it's the Swiss law that influences because uh, Liechtenstein basically has a property law that is, uh, <clears throat> you know, inspired by the Swiss, whereas, for instance, for contracts, obligations, torts, uh, you know, it's the Austrian law. So, an, a, a Liechtenstein judge would look at Swiss cases for property law, would look at, you know, uh, uh, a contract case would look into Austrian uh, case law. Jersey, Guernsey, uh, you know, w w we know uh, that, uh, you know, they, they were part of the Duchy of Normandy uh, and following 1066, basically, uh, it, uh, Jersey became a self-governing dependency of the UK, uh, you know, so the UK influence is something that is quite uh, obvious. Same thing, a similar scenario for Guernsey, San Marino, 1600, first written uh, constitution, and uh, you know, due to the common history uh, uh, and uh, you know, the, the, the law of San Marino uh, is uh, influenced, strongly influenced by Italian law. Proximity, uh, proximity is not just geographically seen, but also culturally seen and also linked to the common uh, history. Uh, the fact that you share, as a small state, you share borders with a certain larger uh, states. The fact that you have a lot of commuters uh, that for work reasons commute in and out every day, that you have a lot of, you know, uh, cross marriages. Uh, this is all something that leads to proximity. And, you know, we have similar scenarios in these um, jurisdictions that uh, I'm trying to uh, uh, basically illustrate. The common language, well, um, look at the role of judges. Uh, judges within Europe uh, should look at judgments written in different languages, but uh, to be honest, uh, it's, uh, you know, when, 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 when you have the opportunity to look at case law uh, of a jurisdiction uh, where the case law is written in your own language, you would rather look into, uh, uh, into this case law. So for obvious reasons, San Marino judges look more into Italian case law. Uh, Jersey and Guernsey judges look into, uh, you know, cases from uh, English courts and, you know, the whole common law world, of course. And uh, um, uh, Liechtenstein judges, you know, look mostly into uh, what's happening in other German-speaking courts. And now, I'm talking about uh, the next uh, uh, important factor to me for this, uh, how this influence actually happens is the uh, judiciary. So uh, through the judiciary, uh, there is a, I wouldn't say an invisible influence, but at least an influence that is strictly legal and that is not 
political because when it happens through legislation it's always you know political there is a debate but what the judges do uh, is something that sometimes is harder uh, to figure out how they are really influenced and of course we have to look at uh, um, the, the, the fact how positions are filled in the small states who are the judges are it, it, are these judges that are appointed case by case are uh, are these judges uh, that are appointed permanently that are appointed maybe for 10 years and then they go back to their uh, own jurisdiction so for instance for Liechtenstein um, you can uh, look at uh, uh, judges that, uh, uh, you know, are appointed mostly from Austria for the simple fact that uh, uh, Liechtenstein procedural rules are mainly uh, uh, rules uh, uh, from uh, imported uh, from Austria. Uh, so you, you would typically have an, an Austrian judge sitting on the Liechtenstein uh, law case uh, sometimes may be tempted to find a solution according to what he or she has learned back at home before, uh, you know, moving uh, to, uh, to Liechtenstein. So, um, same thing for, you know, San Marino and, 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 and the other jurisdictions that I have talked about. On the other hand, it's also an opportunity, it's a chance for a small jurisdiction to have partly homegrown judges, so to speak, judges that have done all their legal career uh, domestically, but also judges from overseas, or overseas, or at least over the border, over the river would be uh, the, <coughs> the right expression, uh, over the Rhine River, talking about uh, Liechtenstein, uh, for the simple fact uh, that um, being a very small community, you need sometimes some objective, some people looking uh, over the things from a uh, let's say different perspective without any family ties or without any any uh, different ties on the whole uh, thing um, so unfortunately this thing here has stuck now I don't know if the battery maybe I have to okay I, I fixed it thank you I'm sorry I fixed it thank you Peter. Um, now let me give you a brief summary uh, of that um, that the influence can be deliberate. The, the influence in financial issues often is not deliberate, but forced uh, from the uh, uh, you know big states on the uh, small uh, uh, states, and uh, often uh, you know uh, for reasons of efficiency and also for reasons uh, of lack of resources in the small um, uh, jurisdictions. Actually, it's great to have. The influence. So influence uh, often is something uh, that we have to see uh, very positively. Now let's talk about the indirect influence. Um, well, talking about uh, um, the jurisdictions um, that basically use, or as I mentioned at the very beginning, abuse their position uh, for uh, the uh, influence. Um, well, these big states, uh, they, you know, know that uh, in the international, uh, supranational or international bodies, uh, they uh, have politically seen they have much more power. Uh, they decide what's on the agenda and what's not on the agenda. O on the other hand, if you look at small states, they are typically overrepresented when it comes to voting. Uh, so even in, in the international, uh, uh, you know, bodies like European Union, European Economic Area, uh, and FATF, OECD, whatever, uh, uh, you know, small states can try, should try for financial, uh, for their financial agenda actually uh, to put on the table their position and they should, uh, you know, try uh, to specialize on certain fields and to to make themselves uh, heard by the, by the big states that at the end of the day are the ones that are more uh, powerful. Another, uh, you know, field of uh, indirect influence are the so-called academic harmonization projects. Nobody really takes them seriously, especially on a European level, simply because, you know, expectancies were really high 
20, 30 years ago, when I went to law school, everybody said, well, in a few years' time, we will have a you know, European civil code. N nothing happened. Uh, apart from that, I'm not going to talk about the Brexit, don't worry. But uh, you know, I, I have the feeling that things are rather going to the totally different directions. But still, still, national legislators, they look on what has been done on these working uh, groups, you know, on contracts, on torts, on insurance. Uh, and uh, I'm, uh, you know, quite confident uh, that if we really carry it out, and I don't think this has been done on an academic uh, scale, but if we really did a research looking at what has influenced um, legislation of small states um, over the years, I'm sure that what has been done in these working groups is rather realized in small states that are more flexible, that are faster in enacting good solutions uh, than in, uh, in, in big uh, uh, states. Now, last uh, topic uh, that I would briefly like, uh, uh, you know, uh, to mention here is the influence of small states on big states. So, um, you know, in, 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 in my paper, uh, basically, I want to prove uh, that the influence is not a one-way street uh, or should not be a one-way street. Often, it's a one-way street, especially when it happens with force, with pressure. Uh, with non-deliberate, so non-chosen influence. But once the influence happens with a dialogue, um, that, uh, you know, the, 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 the big states can learn a lot from the small states, especially when it comes to niche products in the financial uh, world, in the financial uh, industry. Um, so let me give you a few examples out of the Liechtenstein legislation. When you look at company and trust law, Liechtenstein's legislation in company and trust law uh, has been enacted 90 years ago, in 1926. Uh, and uh, since then, uh, the, um, the Liechtenstein uh, legislation on, on foundations, especially in trust, has been exported uh, to many uh, jurisdictions. Uh, you might be aware of the fact that many jurisdictions uh, in the field of trust law are so-called designer jurisdictions. So what they did, they took the traditional trust law and they gave up the rule against perpetuities. They gave up the principle that uh, uh, private purpose trusts are forbidden, um, uh, are, are void. Uh, they, they gave up the, the principle that trusts typically are not revocable by saying, well, yeah, our trusts are revocable, our trusts are eternal, our trusts uh, are... Um, uh, basically can be purpose trusts, and, and, and we are aware of these pe pieces of legislation, uh, you know, from many states within the United States, for instance, Delaware, South Dakota, we're aware of that from many Caribbean jurisdictions, but hardly anybody is aware of the fact that this has been uh, basically written down 90 years ago in the Principality of, uh, of Liechtenstein. So the legal transplant that happened back then uh, was basically the first step of moving into a world of being a designer jurisdiction. So basically creating a financial center that should attract, uh, you know, money from overseas. Um, so, uh, and, and here is when the whole uh, world, so to speak, of competition between jurisdictions comes into place. At the end of the day, I personally look at the law as any resource, as a resource. It's a resource for a jurisdiction. Some have natural resources, some have, uh, you know, educational resources, so human resources in, in a jurisdiction, and some have legal resources. And small states should use their sovereignty, not abuse their sovereignty. They should not abuse it you know, to enable money laundering or tax evasion. This is the past. And Liechtenstein, San Marino, Jersey, Guernsey, and all other jurisdictions within Europe, they have given up that strategy. Uh, you know, that that's belongs to the past. But still, there is so many advantages beyond tax law, beyond saving taxes, for choosing specific jurisdictions 
you know, for instance, because jurisdictions offer better services in the trust uh, and fiduciary uh, service industry, because uh, jurisdictions uh, have a better uh, regime in the field of uh, succession planning, uh, because the asset protection, I'm talking about not fraudulent behavior, I'm talking about legal asset protection, because it works differently, because it, wor it works in a better way, because you can diversify within a, uh, a company, for instance, you can diversify the liability. Uh, you know, some of you might be familiar with the regime of so-called protected cell company, something, you know, uh, that, uh, for instance, Liechtenstein has enacted uh, years ago, two years ago, following the Guernsey model, the Malta uh, uh, model. So the influence, the cross-influence between jurisdictions and as well the fact that some small jurisdictions that offer very clever solution can export their law. So meaning we'll find big states that actually uh, imitate, you know, that, 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 that create similar solutions in their legislation, inspired by the legislation of uh, small jurisdictions, this should give us some hope, some hope that small jurisdictions actually, and this is goes especially for the financial topics, are not in a weaker, but are actually in a stronger position than uh, the big states. So the answers uh, to my uh, questions, uh, I will, uh, you know, leave them to the, um, you know, paper, the, the written version of the paper, but I'm sure uh, that uh, if we have some time for a discussion, uh, you know, we can uh, uh, together, uh, you know, find uh, some answers to the questions that I had a chance to raise. And thanks again for the invitation to London. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francesco, for that um, very detailed presentation.